Vic, what can you tell us to start with about Paul Weiss and Jerry Richmond, who were doing work in the Spokane area in the 1960s? Well, they, <clears throat> there's a lot to say about them. Um, I uh, first encountered Paul Weiss in 1969 when I was uh, starting my um, uh, dissertation research on the um, Channel Scab Lands and the Missoula Floods. I uh, uh, had written a, uh, a sort of longish paper that uh, was in a, a course that outlined what ultimately was my dissertation. And I communicated about that with, uh, in letters in, in the early, early 69 to Paul Weiss, George Neff, and Roald Frixell, all of whom I found in the literature having been working in the area. And I was able to engage with uh, both Neff and Weiss uh, during the summer of 69. Hmm. So that's when I uh, started interacting with them. Frixell was exceedingly busy. I mean, he was all over the place. Uh, he was doing uh, lunar sample studies. He was doing field work everywhere. Uh, so I never got to interact with him very much. Fortunately, I, I met him before he died, and we had some long discussions at meetings. But um, uh, uh, Jerry Richmond... Um, I knew his work very well because uh, at University of Colorado, one of the things I studied was uh, quaternary stratigraphy and glacial stratigraphy of the western U.S. Richmond was kind of the uh, preeminent Rocky Mountain uh, glacial uh, stratigrapher. Um, he, he had his Ph.D. also from University of Colorado many years before me. Uh, and he, he, uh, he, he was ultimately called the Penck of the Rockies. Uh, Walter Penck was the very famous uh, Swiss, well, the, no, he's German, but he worked extensively in the Alps, working out the Alpine stratigraphy. So when the Europeans came to uh, the U.S. for the 1965 INQA Congress, Richmond organized an uh, immense field trip actually several field trips through the western U.S. looking at glacial deposits. And they, they felt he was the kind of the god of uh, organizing Rocky Mountain glacial stratigraphy. I did meet Richmond uh, in 1970 at the inaugural meeting of the American Quaternary Association, which was held in uh, Bozeman, Montana. And it, uh, it was focused on uh, Yellowstone National Park. Mm. where Rich, Richmond and uh, Ken Pierce, a notable Rocky Mountain stratigrapher, were doing very extensive work. Uh, and so I had some interactions with him, but unfortunately not in the field, in the Scablands, because he had done that uh, earlier. Let me, let me hold you up. This is, this is so great. And I want to go to Scott. We got to keep you hydrated, Vic. I think we're going to be here a while. You're going to have so much to share with us, but I want to bring Sky in right now. So we're talking Rocky Mountains briefly already. Uh, so Sky, I know you're a fan of Frixall and Richmond, or you, you've read much of their stuff. What's your initial take on those two geologists and how much have you read their work? Well, Frixell doesn't have a whole lot of, I mean, died, died early. And so yeah. he doesn't have that 30 or 40 years of, of, uh, of geology, which is, a, which is too bad because everything he did write was terrific and mm. just a, a real perceptive person and was working in the Eastern Scablands a long time ago and would have contributed, he probably would have reshaped a lot of what we understand about that fringe, uh, that uh, interfingering between the Luss, the Palouse and the Scablands. Jerry Richmond, I don't, I don't know anything about him except okay. that basically that 1965 paper and then the Weiss and Richmond, which don't really add much to the story. So the Richmond yeah. that I know is just the guy who kind of put the, the correlation table together um, that kind of goes east to west and, and correlates Cordilleran ice sheet features with Laurentide ice sheet features. So that's, that's all I know. How about one more with you, Sky, and then we'll go back to Vic. What do you know about Paul Weiss? Is, is Weiss different in your mind than, than Richmond? 
for this question for, for you. Me. Yeah, just to get. I don't you know started. anything about Paul Weiss. I, I I kind of feel like he sort of ducks in. I've said this in emails. I think he he's sort of an interloper. I don't know what he. I mean, he must have been some senior geologist at the at the USGS with enough clout to do whatever the hell he wanted. And came out and kind of poked around and then disappears. So I don't know anything about him. Well, here's a good idea. Here's an idea. Why don't we talk to somebody who met these guys? All right, Vic. So, uh, so yeah, how okay, about how about Weiss, Vic? Well, Paul was uh, in the Spokane office of the uh, USGS. It was in the uh, post office building uh, downtown, and wow. uh, he was. Uh, He's basically a field geologist. Uh, I, I haven't read up on his uh, actual background, but he did uh, extensive uh, mapping, particularly in the USGS program that was focused on potential mineral uh, areas in, the, in wilderness zones. Uh, he, he loved to talk about his experience in the Cascades because they would uh, Helicopter into field sites, and there were terrific trout fishing lakes in the in the upper <laughs> Cascades. And Paul was a big fan of that. And that uh, makes sense. yeah, and but he had a bunch of quads that he mapped in uh, you know north of Spokane. Uh, one of them uh, that came out about the time of my dissertation was called the Green Acres Quad. It was. Uh, kind of the southern lower end of the Rathdrum Prairie. And so he uh, had to necessarily put the quaternary units in on that. And uh, I believe uh, Richmond connected with him as a result of that, because Richmond was doing broad brush work all over the Rockies. And he was... Uh, he got into Glacial Lake Missoula basically because of correlations that were done between glacial deposits in the Bitterroot Mountains and Glacial Lake Missoula. These were done by a guy named Weber. I've never gone back to look at that in detail, but there were presumably some interfingering of Missoula uh, lacustrine units or at least strand lines with the uh, glacial moraines in the Bitterroots. Uh, it's probably something that should be revisited because that was done in the early 50s or late late 40s. Hmm. Uh, and okay. uh, that, that gets into the story because there, you find in that 65 work, not just the paper in the uh, quaternary of the U.S. volume, but also in the guidebook that was done for the INQA Congress, Richmond referring to, uh, yeah, those things. Uh, yeah, I had that when I was in the field and you looked did. at yeah, looked at the field sites that were in there. Uh, and that that's part of the the story of how uh, this uh, correlation was done to the Pinedale and Bull Lake uh, through the um, uh, through largely Richmond's work and, and Paul Weiss adopted that of course because that was kind of the conventional story. Uh, that got mixed up. You referred to it in an earlier uh, segment because uh, there was a kind of an uncertainty as to how much of this was related to mountain glaciation and how much was related to Cordilleran ice sheet. The uh, the paradigm, so called, uh, moved after the '60s into this all being related to Cordilleran ice sheet, but. Uh, Richmond, even in a 1986 paper he did, which has not been referenced very often, it was a uh, set of correlations he did uh, of the uh, Rocky Mountain to the Cordilleran in a Earth Science Reviews, uh, Reviews article. This was not long before Richmond died that that paper came out. And mm. he, he kind of backs off some of the terminology, he doesn't use Bull Lake anymore. He refers to Illinoisan and pre-Illinoisan uh, and then Wisconsin uh, deposits. Uh, so he, he backs away from the Rocky Mountain Glacial, which is uh, Pinedale and Bull Lake. Uh, we, we can get into well, yeah. terminology if you want. But well, it's a, that's, it's, yeah, it's I, a I, Byzantine I, subject. <laughs> Byzantine, I love that. Oh, so, so this this is working beautifully, first of all. So thanks, fellas. I appreciate your time this morning. 
Uh, number two, Sky, I want you to feel like you can jump in with questions as well, whenever, okay? And Sky's got about a dozen uh, illustrations and maps and maybe a photo or two. I'm not quite sure, but we're going to save that for a little bit. Yeah. Um, I, I uh, want to remind the viewers that uh, we're, this is a post-Ice Age Floods uh, recorded session, and so we're referring to things that have happened over the past winter. I had a color scheme. Red was the Wisconsin advance, or the late Wisconsin advance, which is evidence of glaciers, continental and alpine ice, younger than 30,000 years ago, which is what most people have been focusing on. But the, the ultimate theme of this session, doesn't have to be all related to that, is what happened to the discussion of those older deposits, the blue time, as I was calling it, which is older than 30,000 years ago. So these terms, Pine Dale and Bull Lake and other things get thrown in there. So back to you, Vic. And then, yes, please, Sky, jump in when you like. I want to know more about what, why did this conference happen? Was Richmond really the ringleader of the entire, like, East Coast to West Coast thing? And how much of Brett's and his publications in the 50s uh, prompted this, do you think? Well, the, the conference was organized a little before my time. Yeah. Uh, the actual meetings were held in Boulder, Colorado. I ultimately went there in, in 1967. Okay. The conference was held in 65. Yeah. My uh, PhD advisor, uh, Bill Bradley at University of Colorado, was one of the principal local meeting hosts and um and he he was uh he had been involved with richmond uh they, they had worked together on the description of the glacial deposits of the rocky mountain national park uh and and richmond was very familiar uh in our in the department i think he was even an adjunct uh faculty member though he didn't do anything at, at the time i was there uh so the conference was a big deal. It was uh, INQAS, the International Quaternary Association, largely dominated by Europeans. Uh, yeah, uh, it, it is a, uh, uh, an international chartered thing. Uh, the U.S. National Academy of Sciences has a uh, pays dues to it. Um, I was, for a time in the 90s, the U.S. representative, so I went officially to some meetings. I went to one in Berlin. Every four years, they have a big conference, and they have multiple field trips that, uh, mm. that go with it. In the U.S., it was viewed as a means of uh, bringing together quaternary science in a big way. And so it, it had a whole lot of publications. Uh, the, the the most famous one was the uh, the one that was put out by uh, Herb Wright from University of Minnesota and uh, Fry. I don't remember where he was from. It's a, a big, thick volume. Had uh, sort of general papers on uh, nature of quaternary science. A geochronology paper by Wally Broker, who became exceedingly famous for his uh, geochemistry work. Uh, Stan Shum on fluvial processes, lots of lo uh, stratigraphic papers, including the one with uh, Richmond, Frixell, Neff, and Weiss on the, uh, you know, the the sort of northwestern you know cataclysmic flood interaction area. So it it was it was an attempt to kind of just breathe immense life into quaternary science in. The U.S. Uh, I, I, there may be twenty or thirty books that came out of it, uh, so it was a big deal. And Richmond had—I know he had the Northern Rocky Mountains trip. I think he had a Southern Rocky Mountains trip. There were before meeting trips, after meeting trips. The uh, Rocky Mountain one, Northern Rockies, that had Glacial Lake Missoula. It had a couple of subgroups that went in slightly different places. They are the ones that famously sent Brett's the telegram or message afterwards. We are now all kept catastrophists. And that was the, uh, a, an immense delight to, to Brett's. Uh, he refers to it in his 1969 Journal of Geology paper. He, 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 you know, he, was, he was tickled pink with all the attention that he got um, from the 
from after the INQA meeting onward because he was being recognized. Well, that's the main reason I know about the conference. I mean, that's part of the lore that they're sending the telegram to Brett's uh, from the field or right after they get back to civilization or whatever. And I guess the other reason I know about the INQA stuff is because Stephen Porter from the University of Washington was doing local trips and those those things keep circulating. Uh, mm -hmm. Sky, the Bull Lake Pinedale uh, labels for these two different generations of glaciation, does it seem to you like it seems to me, Sky, that the 1960s are this important time because the narrative seems to change and suddenly everything is talking about the most recent ice. We're just giving Vic a break, but I'm just trying to yeah. get your take on from the Rocky Mountain perspective. Is, is that it seems like a crucial decade where the narrative is changing in a big way? What's your take yeah. on the 1960s from what you've read and, and, and thought about? Yeah, well, let's see. A couple things. Um, I think at that time in geology, there were big personalities and there were few of them. And I think that's something that you know, we still have big personalities, but we have more geologists today, and there's a more connected community, and maybe not as a, maybe one guy can't shape geology like, like in the past, you know, a small handful of people in the past really did steer a lot of the thinking for a long time. Another thing that I see is, uh, I'll get your question, but yeah. let me just get this Good. off my mind. Good. Um, I see because the INQUA conference, that 1965 gathering, brought Europeans into the mix, and Richmond was kind of a product of that that thinking of that time, that World War II and pre-World War II, um, that his work reflects that European approach, his correlation table, his his need to correlate across the United States is very European. I mean, it's just huh. exactly what people did there a hundred years ago. And then I think with that 1965 INQA conference, um, it's funny because in the late 80s and early 90s, the DNAG volume, the GSA oh, yeah. Decade of North American Geology volumes came out, this big, thick, encyclopedic kind of uh, wall-sized collection of books that hardly ever gets referenced it's funny because that 1965 paper and that herb Wright and Wright and fry there was something different that was going on then that stuck with the community um and i think it represents just a solid understanding of geology a field geology of a time kind of time gone by free computer free technology in a lot of ways, and mm. I think the the writing was great. I just think that 1965, like you say, that that 60s time was a change in a lot of things. But that <laughs> yeah. Inqua volume kind of codified a lot of the last century, whereas stuff that's come after has been a little smaller. I think, and it's really on, yeah. I guess I'll just stop there. Well, let's get Vic's reaction to that. Do you see that similarly, Vic? Well, I think that is true. I I, uh, I, I like uh, Sky's uh, perspective on these things. As a, 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 a maybe he's a little bit different generation than me. Uh, <laughs> uh, and that's that's uh, that, that's very useful to see. Uh, and definitely, there were these big uh, personalities uh, of that time. And I was fortunate, you know, to meet, you know, uh, people who came through Colorado that were big personalities like uh, Jim Galuli and Jay Tuzo Wilson, you know, of the plate tectonics fame. I mean, I, 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 I got to see these people. Uh, I, I kind of was just in the in the transition as, uh, you know, plate tectonics was beginning to, to uh, come in. I, I had actually gone to Colorado thinking I wanted to study tectonics, and uh, it, it something repelled me. Everybody was doing it, and so mm. uh, I, I was just naturally wanted to do something 
different. And uh, I don't, mm-hmm. I don't even know that I had that as a plan, but <laughs> that that's what I wound up doing. Uh, but but I, you know, one other thing that I think was important in the the whole business was that we didn't have the powerful geochronology tools in the 1960s that have emerged later. And those geochronology tools tend to, to lead to a certain emphasis on what was studied. Mm-hmm. When Richmond was doing his work, he got famous initially for a study he did, I think it was his PhD dissertation work, but it was a USGS project in the LaSalle Mountains of Utah. Mm-hmm. He published it as a GS, uh, um, uh, ge- geological survey professional paper I think in the early, it might have come out in the early 60s, it was based on work in the 50s. And it was, it was correlation emphasizing, just like uh, uh, Sky said, but correlating on one of these big uh, mountain masses in the Colorado Plateau, where you go from desert landscapes at low elevations to glaciated landscapes, rock glaciers, paraglacial features at high elevation. And how do you do these correlations? Uh, because these are all different phases of uh, what was operating at any particular time. So what Richmond pioneered in, and another guy at the survey who did this was Roger Morrison, the use of paleosols on uh, basically unconformity, disconformity boundaries. So uh, this was important in that correlation chart that uh, Sky works out. He was interpreting particular degrees of soil development at particular times as things that could be correlated from one landscape to another. And the the soils vary in their facies, uh, using a geological term, that is partly a function of climate. But you can tell by a relative development of uh, length of time that the soils have had to form, and also in the buried soils that they look different in different places. So very much in that Richmond uh, work is an implied recognition of, of the younger Wisconsin deposits with maybe moderate developed soils that developed in the uh, uh, early part of the Holocene, largely. And then these would be on top of older deposits with clearly distinctive uh, soils. Uh, in the uh, Palouse uh, area, the, the younger post-Wisconsin uh, Palouse Luce is, is uh, very different than the um, uh, Wisconsin age Luce, which is paler than the more weathered, uh, older part of the Luss. And those soils, Frixell entered into that game too. So that, that use of soils was key to this distinction. Uh, and, and it appears in the detailed descriptions, I, I, I shouldn't say detailed, uh, somewhat less detailed than we <laughs> like descriptions <Hello>. of <laughs> yeah. uh, stuff in Richmond's guidebook articles. Yeah. Yeah. This is, we're, we're in the sweet spot now. This is where I was hoping we would go at least for a portion of today. And Sky, I'm guessing you have a few illustrations that fit nicely with where we are right now. Why don't sure. we bring Sky's uh, slides in and we'll just keep this discussion going. But yes, I think the sweet spot for our time together. Go ahead and, sh- and share when you when you can, Sky. Sure. Is uh, right. is yeah. Go ahead, please. I was just going to say just one thing. Yeah, one thing that never really gets said, and uh, especially non professional geologists don't maybe think about it. But in bedrock geology, you have the formation concept, right? Layers of like rock that that um, have clear contacts that we draw black lines between on maps, and, and then we have formations. In quaternary geology, you're talking about stuff that isn't quite rock yet, and we don't have the formation concept that, that goes across the board. So like Vic says, you have to use everything that's available to you, and soils become very important. Whereas in the rock record, you know, you're not talking about Jurassic soils or Permian soils very often. Most of the time, you're, most of the time you're, you're talking about rock types. So 
the formation concept is not really part of quaternary geology the way it is bedrock geology. And the transition between quaternary and, and older stuff, older tertiary stuff sometimes is kind of interesting because it's not quite rock and it's not quite soil. Hmm. Anyway, I thought hmm. I'd say that. Yeah. All right, let me see here. Share. Yeah, please do. And yeah, while you're doing that, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking like, so what's the problem with that? If there's not this formation system in place in the quaternary stuff, it, that's limiting recognition of certain things? I know you're trying to share at the same time, but like, what's the significance of what you just said, Sky? Are you going to show us that? Like, <laughs> what significance? Well, of anything I say is always. Oh, simple. stop uh, it. Let's see. Stop it. Um, let's see. So, what's the significance? Well, it takes a different kind of person um, and a different education um, and a different mentor and a different landscape. I mean, it's a different world when you. When you talk about, you know, mapping red, white, and blue geology of the Rocky Mountain Foreland, mm -hmm. I mean, go put your thumb on every contact and it's a piece of cake. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, when you're, when you're not in familiar rocky terrain and you're not putting in faults and folds and, you know, strikes and dips, you know, you lose a certain number of people just because it's not really that interesting. And, and oil companies don't care about it and you know you're not really mining a whole lot of things in in uh, soils well diamonds sometimes but it's a different world and i think it's um sort of taking a back seat to, to a lot of ge quaternary geology has always kind of played second fiddle unless you get into the pacific northwest where the quaternary is about the only thing that people care about other than the basalts and so you know volcanoes and floods and shoreline processes and glacial deposits those are cool in the Pacific Northwest, but in the Rocky Mountains, you just got much, you know, you got the whole sweep of history to work with. And so, huh. anyway. Uh, yeah, really interesting. I think there's a big transition. There's a, there's a pretty bright line still between, and these images will show that, there's still a pretty bright line between Laurentide Ice Sheet, Cordilleran Ice Sheet. So let me just show a few Good. of these maps. Thank you. Right. Uh, share. Sky. You did a nice job a second ago. And, and yeah, Vic, I think the hope here is that uh, it's you and Sky now for a little while going back and forth. Just jump in when you when you see an image, uh, a map, and you want to, oh, you right. got problems now. <laughs> Am I stuck here? Uh, let's see. There you go. Can you see that? Okay. Absolutely. Very good. All right. So let's just run through a few of these larger maps fairly quickly. Um, starting with this Flint Geological Society of America compilation of the glacial stuff that sits on the, on the ground across the United States from Maine to Montana. Mm. And so in 59, here's the state of the art by Flint, one of the you know, great geologists of the Quaternary. But note that mapping, so let's just run through the colors. Some of these older deposits, Nebraska and Iowa and Kansas, and, and then the green is all our, our friendly neighborhood, uh, Wisconsin. But note the mapping ends before you get to Glacier National Park. So this is all east of the Rockies, mm -hmm. east of the Rockies, 1959. Mm -hmm. If we look at 1932, just backing up sort of where Alden was, one of the earliest maps he was mapping, here's Glacier National Park on the left side of that image. Here's some older ice sheet deposits and a reconstructed artistic rendering. And then the Wisconsin. So two different ages of glacial deposits and, and their corresponding um, ice margins. So that's 32. The previous one was 59. Let's move forward in time. Thank you. To 65. So it's 1965, USGS and Denny, I don't know. Um, compiles the basic glacial geology for the United States here. And again, we see those same older tongues sticking out from beneath that green Wisconsin um, till and uh, various drift deposits. Mm -hmm. um, what's interesting here is in the legend, it says includes all glaciations in the mountains of Western United States. And then it's shown only east of the Rocky Mountains. So there's this distinction in the data that's available to what's east of the Rockies versus what's west of the Rockies. So there's more detail 
and more work that's been done in the Laurentide versus the Cordilleran. Yeah. So if we look at... Before uh, you leave that one, I yeah, just yeah. want to point out an in interesting thing. Uh, Glacial Lake Missoula is shown, not right. accurately. <laughs> there are two, two lakes shown in eastern Washington. Neither one of those was lakes. Uh, one, <laughs> one of those is uh, the Pasco Basin, uh, the Walla Walla, and the uh, Yakima Rivers, which was uh, viewed as uh, Lake Lewis. That, that yes. was thought to be a glacial lake. The other dot is the Quincy Basin, uh, which also had ponded water in it. Th those were flood impoundments. Yeah. But, uh, but uh, Lake Lewis was viewed as a lake by Flint, and uh, who I did meet. Um, well, you did. Uh, Flint, yeah, I, I met I met Flint. Uh, it, that's an interesting story. Uh, <laughs> uh, the uh, uh, Flint was uh, really important as a compiler of stuff from all over the world. His uh, glacial and quaternary geology book was a immense compilation. Uh, as a uh, field geologist. Uh, uh, Jay Harlan Bretz had a very different <laughs> opinion of it. Uh, 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 that's also a long story. Um, but uh, anyway. Um, yeah. Yeah. That, and, and also Glacial Lake Columbia is not shown at all. Yes, that's at right. That time. So at 1965, yeah. we were still, you know, still transitioning to sort of modern thinking. This is an interesting one I came across. 1992 compilation of the thickness and character of quaternary sediments east of the Rocky Mountains, again, by Solar, or Solar, USGS 1992. And I love this kind of thing. We don't see much of this anymore. You're right. Relative reliability of mapping with a little scale there. Now, Whoa. wouldn't that be nice to see more of? Now, I'd be pissed if I did all my mapping in, in Mon <laughs> Montana, and they're like, there's no <laughs> reliability on my work. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Here you are, low group. And then, and then looking at sort of, I just drew this hastily, roughly. But oh, it's beautiful. I, I think this says to me what I, my understanding is from looking at Puget Sound, looking at the northern northeastern Washington, looking at where I live here in the Mission, um, and then east of Glacier National Park, and then the Midwest all the way to New England. This pattern makes sense with what the literature says, but there's sort of a disconnect between what Kathy Truth and uh, Derek Booth and others have done over here in Puget Sound versus what's done in the Spokane area or areas north versus what's done in my neck of the woods versus what's done in the Midwest. And I include sort of eastern Montana in the Midwest. So it, it's almost like Richmond was trying to unify a lot of this, but we still, what, 50, 60, 70, 80 years later, we're still not there. But I think this pattern of younger and older holds in my mind. I'm curious, Vic, do you... Do you uh, agree, disagree, thoughts on that? Well, it, there's a lot of uh, open questions. Uh, certainly, uh, Richmond in 65, and all, I think also in his 86 paper, I haven't looked at that in detail, he shows a lot of uh, morainal features of the Flathead Lobe in Mission Valley. Uh, all, all kinds of uh, stuff going down to almost to Dixon, uh, and uh, and he also, I know in, I think in both of the papers, he refers to uh, the evidence in the scab lands of mega flood deposits that are pre-Wisconsin in age. And he, I know in 86, he refers to those as, well, if there was a glacial lake Missoula, then you had to have a, a pre-Wisconsin release of glacial lake Missoula. Because they're clearly flood deposits. I've seen them in many locations, and I, I just uh, uh, my PhD student Peter Patton found these in 1977, particularly the uh, Marengo site in eastern Washington, where intercalated with with uh, Palouse Low sheets, you've got old catastrophic flood deposits under petrochalcic horizons. 
Uh, and these may even be uh, pre uh, Bernays Matsuyama reversal, and, and older than about you know seven hundred thousand years ago. Uh, and those, uh, and you've got, yeah, this one, you've got the old maid Cooley site that was known to Kirk Bryant. He described that in back in, uh, his 27 yeah. blues yeah. list paper and, yeah. uh, and Brett's describes it in his 56 paper. Those are flood deposits also. Uh, uh there, there, there's at least one that nobody's described that I know about in the Cheney Palouse that, um, uh, got uh, unfortunately destroyed in a flood. Um, I, I've got a. I should write something about it, uh, but uh, and so Richmond felt these must. If the paradigm is that all the floods come from glacial Lake Missoula, and of course that was never an absolute. Uh, and it, even going back to Pardee, the you know there's mm-hmm. recognition that. You know, Glacial Lake Missoula, even though Pardee knew about it, even he ne- didn't necessarily think it was the only possible source of... Oh, okay. Flood. Okay. Hang yeah. on, hang on, hang on. Hey, hey yeah. Scott, can you stop your share for a sure. sec? We're, we're sure. going to come back to those slides, but this this feels pretty big right now. I, I got to see Vic nice and nice and big on my screen here. Not. Oh, okay. Here. So let, let's say this again. So, I mean, Vic, you, <laughs> I, I appreciate you watching these episodes this winter. I, I, I just am imagining you now, like thinking as I'm asking episode after episode, what the hell happened to the Spokane ice sheet? And are we sure all that water came from Montana? I truly didn't know what we were going to end up with. And it was kind of an incomplete ending, to be honest with you. I'm just trying to imagine you, episode after episode, are you just sitting back going, You got the wrong, you're even asking the wrong questions. What are you doing? Like, no, it is all Montana water. Or, yeah, you're you're sniffing around at stuff that has been the subtext for most of this work in the last 50 years. Can we hit it right on the head for just a second? Uh, Where are you just generally with those deposits around Spokane? Are you saying Pardee, as well as yourself, are still open to the idea that there's, it's not all Montana water, for instance? As, as you probably know, uh, I have become quite interested in kind of the whole philosophical approach that's taken in the earth sciences. And uh, so, sorry for going out on a little tangent here. Let's go, let's but, go. But... The there's always there's been always these questions about uh, what is the question we're trying to deal with in science, and it inevitably is being posed by scientists. They are asking a particular question, uh, and as Sky referred to, maybe the questions were being asked by the big names in the field. I have come to the conclusion, and I sense this through my whole career. The important questions are not the ones the scientists ask. It is the ones that nature poses to us that we can interpret from the anomalies that appear in nature. Mm. And I think, and this is something I'm working on right now, this propelled J. Harlan Bretz in his career. And I think it also propelled Pardee that they intuitively sensed that the important questions were the ones posed by nature, not the ones that were posed by other scientists. Hmm. I think, I think Bre- this became clear to Bretz when he made what he viewed as the greatest mistake of his life. It was the paper that he told me he wished could be erased from the scientific literature and have everyone forget it. And that was his submergence paper of the uh, explaining the erratics of the lower Columbia by a marine submergence. He came to that because that was the question posed by yeah. other scientists. Uh-huh. Yeah. He, yeah. Re- he, after that, totally rebelled on that. He taught his students to go in the field and not read the literature on the particular location. He didn't tell them to ignore the literature. He told them to learn everything they could. 
but he wanted them to go in the field and see the problems that were presented by nature itself. He taught his field courses that, that I have, I have testimonials from his students writing more than Brett's did himself about how he operated uh, in that field course. And he, uh, he, he, he wanted the students to see for themselves and then to go to the literature after that. And many of them discovered that the people who had studied it before were wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and that it was actually the facts in the field that told you the answer. So I've always, uh, in, initially instinctively, and now with the force of a lot of philosophical background, felt that this was an exceedingly important thing about how we do uh, geology. Uh, and uh, as I said, I, th I, I know enough about Brett's and I'm learning enough more than I even knew 30 years ago when I wrote more, some about Pardee that they were both propelled by the same kind of thinking. Yeah. Uh, for various reasons that probably could be another entire episode, Pardee was uh, reluctant to uh, be as forceful with his writing about it than Brett's was. Yeah. Can I jump in there? Yeah. He, he, Brett's writes so much and he's so honest. He's like the classic Midwest, you know, I just just telling you what he thinks. He's real straightforward. And so we can interpret that. Part E is very buttoned up uh, all the way through. Um, the incentives today are different than uh, you're mentioning field geologists and, and the, 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 the questions posed by nature only come to you by spending a significant amount of time out in the uncomfortable, you know, field. And, uh, I remember I was in grad school, and this has stuck with me a long time, as I had a, call, a classmate who was doing a, a thesis, and she said, oh, my thesis is uh, we're going to hike five miles into the Tetons, and we're going to whack off a chunk of rock about this big, and I'm going to take it back to the lab, and I'm going to spend the next two years looking at it <laughs> through the microscope. <laughs> and I thought, you know, yeah. okay, good for you. Uh, yeah. Who's your professor again? It remind yeah. me never to take yeah. that class. Because <laughs> I mean, you know, what? Who's driving the question? It has nothing to do with discovery, and maybe there's not enough time under a grant-driven situation. Okay, fine, but it is a little weird that we have so much of that in geology, where you you come in, you have six master students and three PhDs, and they're all going to answer these questions that are preformed. It's a little little odd. Well, it's, it's expensive interesting. expensive and it's strange. Yeah, I mean, there's there's many narratives here over the last hundred years. One is less and less time in the field for whatever reason. That just seems to be uh, we're 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 reducing the pure calendar days out there on some of these places. And then let's go back to what you just said, Vic. You're getting fired up there. I like that. You're, you start enunciating. It's like, you know, you said, I, it's Thursday, and I told you to take the trash out. Why isn't the trash out? Yeah, I, I, I was almost, I, I love it. I love it. So, Vic, is the Spokane area worth more attention? Is nature trying to tell us things with some outcrops? that should be revisited a hundred years later. Definitely. I mean, that's always the case. E everything uh, should be revisited. Uh, and uh, uh, the Spokane area, there's old places that have been lost to us that we should have seen. I mean, I, I look at those pictures of pan tops. Boy, I wish I, wish I was there. Not just to see pan tops, because geology is not about the specific outcrops. I, I remember in my early field experiences in uh, New York State, when I was taking my initial formal geology courses, I was always a geologist. I was always looking at geology even before I went to university. But it, in, in, in New York, we would go to outcrops. My uh, professor, Jerry Friedman, was a uh, sedimentologist and, uh, 
And uh, you'd had two kinds of people, those who attacked the outcrop with rock hammers and broke off little pieces that <laughs> looked at it. And then you had the people that stood back and tried to look at that uh, whole outcrop, think about it, think about it in the context of other places. Yeah. Uh, you have to do both in geology, but you can't just do what Sky said. Uh, yes, you can learn a lot about a rock. Uh, you, we have fantastic capabilities to do uh, detailed analytical things. And it, it's the questions that will be posed by those analyses that are interesting, not the fact that they confirm one idea or another. Mm. There's a, it, it, we could get into heavy philosophy here, I, idea, but the idea that you are just out there to confirm hypotheses is a creativity killer. Yeah. Uh, oh, wow. It, 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 it tracks a different student, too. It's a different yes. student that's willing to do that. Yeah. It's fine if you've got those people around to do the dull stuff, uh, but uh, uh, <laughs> someone has to think about the, uh, the larger contextual picture. That's why geological maps are made. You know, the, the fools that don't understand geology think you're only putting things on a spatial grid. Uh, the geological mapping is is creating a dynamic hypothesis of the nature of space and time in rela relationship to what was going on geologically. So, you know, what I just said is completely alien, let's say, to a physicist. Uh, uh, and, you know, that um, communicating what geology is all about, you cannot do in a bunch of short words in a textbook or things like that. You have to take people out in the field and rub their noses in it. Uh, you have to set them loose with guidance and help from mentors, but uh, they've got to discover for themselves. And importantly, they've got to make mistakes for themselves and realize that there's answers, there's ways to get around what they misunderstood because nature is not going to lie to them. Nature can be subtle, nature can be difficult, but nature will not lie. And, and uh, uh, so you've got, a, you've got a, a, a friend in what you do to try to figure out things in the field. Beautifully done. That was a really fun interlude. Sky, let's go back to those slides, but that was, that was solid gold right there. Thank you, Vic, for that. Wow. Um, yeah, let's go back and just take have Sky lead us in a couple different directions or continue to build on a few things we've said. This doesn't have to be two more hours, by the way, but let's just see what else we want to do here. Thank you, I'm Sky. Yeah, I'm interested in this. You guys can see that? We can. Oh, 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 okay. Yes. Um, so these three options are, the, this is your sketch, Nick, and I just yeah. made it square. Uh, let's see. So... This, this applies to kind of a lot of places, but it's certainly here in the Mission Valley, which is sort of this transit, you know, the easternmost portion of the Cordilleran Ice Sheet, but it applies in el elsewhere, you know, Puget Sound, Northeast Washington. But this idea that are we looking at glacial moraines that are MIS-2 or MIS-6, that Pine Dale or Bull Lake, and and what is the, the role of that MIS-4, if, if at all? So we see evidence in LUS for these things. We see evidence in glacial till for these different times. And we see evidence for these things in these time periods in glacial flood deposits. Mm -hmm. But more and more, I, I keep um, here in Montana, western, northwest Montana, and probably in Idaho as well, is this story seems to be favored more and more, where we're kind of going away from the evidence for a, for a Bull Lake uh, glacial episode, so glacial till, and more like splitting this MIS-2 into two phases. And certainly here in Mission Valley, there it's unclear what we're looking at. Um, I don't think this MIS-4 story is well-developed anywhere, but Pinedale versus Bull Lake or earlier versus younger in the MIS-2, those are, those are fundamental questions that seem to still be out there. And 
it's a cross-cutting relationship. You've got some older stuff and some younger stuff, some older stuff and some younger stuff. But how old? Uh, we always know how young, but how old is that underlying hill or outwash or, or lake beds or, or flood deposits? So I, I just thought this was a great um, sort of unifying concept that you put together in a sketch the other day, Nick. And I, and I, I don't know, is this, is this something, uh, Vic, that is interesting to you, this sort of framing? Uh, yes, uh, but the question may be different in different places. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cer certainly uh, in the Glacial Lake Missoula story, uh, Pardee, uh, in his uh, um, Unusual Currents GSA paper, recognized an earlier, bigger phase, uh, a massive outflow that he recognized in the high eddy deposits and the coarse gravels. And then you had the lake silts that were uh, younger. And in many places, the, uh, you, you get the younger lake silts on top of the coarse gravels. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, some of Richmond's work uh, suggested that it, it's at least implied in some of his earlier descriptions, I think in the 65 guidebook, maybe also in the 65 inqua volume, that where you find the, the younger, he thought there was a younger set of lake silts on top of coarse gravels, that that was Pinedale on top of uh, Bull Lake. Mm. But we now know that those coarse gravels, thanks to the, uh, the, the geochronology uh, bit that, uh, that uh, uh, Smith worked out, yeah, Larry, uh, Larry uh, that those coarse gravels, which always I inferred were older because yeah. it, when you go to the nine mile site, yeah. and it's remarkable that Richard never describes this or or even uh, Chambers, there are gravels and the whole the whole set of uh, rhythmites are inset to coarse <laughs> gravels. Yes, of coarse gravels and fly big floods. Yeah. You can produce the bed forms in those rhythmites in the Tushi beds. You can produce them, and I wrote this in a uh, review of Richard's original 1980 paper. You can produce them in a flume that's one meter deep, mm. moving sand, with the energy levels of a flume one meter deep transporting sand in a laboratory. You can produce all those bed forms, and they're described exactly. So there is nothing in the Tushi beds themselves that implies that they are a massive flooding event, nor was that the case in Glacial Lake Missoula. They had produced by bottom currents that the floods that would emanate from Glacial Lake Missoula, and this was described in a modeling paper I did with Petri Alho a number of years ago, the energy levels would sweep those things out of Lake Glacial Lake Missoula, particularly in the uh, uh, you know, in the Clark Fork Bend area, uh, the, the energy levels, you don't, uh, don't deposit silts in those. The only deposit you could get would be coarse gravels and boulders. Uh, so there was always a problem with, with the dynamics of that. And this relates to the story because you had an early massive flooding phase. And, and I think uh, Larry's date give it about 18,000, 19,000 years ago. And then you had late phase where the lake was probably dammed and it had bottom currents in it from releasing water. But they certainly weren't the biggest floods. Mm -hmm. uh, exactly how they manifest themselves downstream is, is unclear. Uh, and, uh, when, Listen, uh, yeah. I, so, so you, so you're, you're pinning all of that flood gravel and that Clark Fork story that, um, Larry Smith's developed really well to just sort of, uh, all late Wisconsin. And we don't yes. have that older record here. Well, Richmond thought there was older record. <laughs> he thought, he thought, and, and there may be inklings of this in Pardee's paper, that there were uh, two ages of the rhythmites in uh, uh, the lake bottom sediments in Glacial Lake Missoula. 
there was an older, he thought, and this is Richmond's work, more weathered, therefore older, set of uh, lake silts that he wanted to correlate to Bull Lake. Now, I haven't gone back to the sites to look at that in more detail. I think that the places he's talking about are along the Flathead River and maybe uh, in, in, in that area, not, not in the Mission Valley. Uh, but um, my, the, the work I've done in there didn't really convince me that there was that <laughs> older, older story. And the, the Mission Valley, which you know well, is there's a lot of complicated stuff in the subsurface there that, that would be nice to have, you know, somebody trench through, uh, yeah. uh, what, 50 meters of depth <laughs> through the whole thing. Yeah. But unfortunately, we don't have that. So, but I don't rule out the earlier stuff. I, 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 uh, I probably was responsible for the uh, John Shaw getting his 1999 paper published because it, it was, I'm sure it was trashed in reviews. Uh, but Shaw was a, uh, he was a really good observer of uh, glacial lacustrine sedimentation. Mm. And he could never... Uh, figure out why people were saying these had to be massive flood deposits coming all the way from Glacial Lake Missoula. If, if you had uh, ice uh, sheets next to a lake like Glacial Lake uh, Columbia or Glacial Lake Missoula, you would get these kinds of deposits related to the proglacial deltas failing and things like that. They're easily produced that way. There's nothing that made them you know, catastrophic flood deposits that you have to correlate all the way from Atwater's 100 flood section all the way to Glacial Lake Missoula. Shaw didn't believe it. Uh, he, and that was part of the reason why he suggested they were coming from uh, the Cordilleran Ice Sheet. And I, I didn't know that that's absolutely correct. But my feeling is it's a reasonable hypothesis based on field ob observations. It should be published. And so, yeah. Uh, yeah, Shaw was Shaw. Shaw was just an abrasive guy, right? And he hit. He was of, difficult guy. He and, hit some nerves with. The, yes, got, yeah. You know, he got Atwater a little riled up, which must be the only person that's ever done that. <laughs> well, Brian, Brian is an exceedingly careful stratigraphic yeah. geologist. And, yeah, uh, and his arguments and, for bringing water south down the sand poil, Shaw's arguments for bringing water down the sand, sand poil were just sort of stupid. But, but, but elsewhere in the Columbia region, you have plenty of those north-south trenches, like Jerome Lessiman has yes. been detailing. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, no, I, I fully agree that Shaw was a, a difficult person, which had to do with some personal issues of his, of his uh, which we don't need to go into. Uh, but he was, a, he, he, was a, a, he was inspired by the evidence he got, uh, and he developed some interesting hypotheses. He had a lot of students who have also, like Jerome, who gone on to do a lot of interesting things. I think it was a tragedy that uh, he died the way he did. Um, I, I was lucky I got to know him some. Uh, unfortunately, I got to know a lot of great people. And Sky, you're definitely one of them. So, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, Wow. Yeah. yeah no, <laughs> we'll see. Sky's a fantastic uh, observer in the field. Uh, I mean, he, he definitely, uh, but as I said, he's got to, uh, he's got to uh, get some of this out in the more uh, accessible literature. Yeah, uh, all right. Yeah. I hear that. That's what Richard says, too. Okay. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Let's go back to the slides and just maybe round this out. Uh, yeah. We'd love to see a few more things that you have. You're blushing right now, Sky, but we can we yeah. can we can we can hide that now. That's good. Okay. Well, yeah, when let, we're, let's keep going. You know, you're talking to Vic Baker. You don't you don't you got to blush a little bit. That's of course, pretty you do. rarefied air. Yeah. Yes, exactly. So, so Vic, let me let me take issue with a couple things lightly here with a couple oh, good, things that, good that God, I come up with after that love letter. Now I you're going to take I issue. I'm okay, <laughs> trip him up here in the hallway. Uh, let's see. 
So here's Baker and Bunker, which is one of those great papers that puts a lot of good thinking together, but kind of flies under the radar. This is a great paper to kind of summarize, even though it was 85, it, it really, it's, it's a good one. So read that, all you people out there interested. Um, but here's one of the issues that I have with floods research, and not necessarily you specifically, but here it is. Early studies centered on physiographic relationships. The resolution of the cataclysmic flood hypothesis consumed scientific work until the 60s. Let me reread that phrase. The resolution of the flood hypothesis continued until the 60s. So to me, that as a young geologist, I'm reading that going, oh, the implication is we solved this by the 60s. Even though I don't think that's what you meant, that's one of the messages that I think a lot of young geologists that are interested in Scabland stuff um, hear that, oh, Wait solved that. Oh, Baker solved that. Oh, Atwater solved that. And um, I, I guess I just sort of chafe against that sometimes um, in, in the literature. There is a sense that, oh, yeah, no, we, we, we got it. We got it. And I've spent 25 years in the scab lands, and I can tell you there's a lot of those fundamental papers that people think have solved things that have, you know, first order errors or, or problems that are not addressed and avoided. And there's still major questions out there, even though the story is old and well covered and the smartest people in the world have covered it. You okay. See my, you see a reason for my slight yes. criticism there? Okay. Yes, it, it's it's uh, it, it's the 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 problem that uh, I like to tell my students comes from the movie Cool Hand Luke, you know, <laughs> where uh, Paul Newman is being slapped down by the prison warden, and uh, it says we have a failure here to communicate. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so. Uh, the failure to communicate is our language. Uh, it, it bewitches us. Uh, resolving the cataclysmic flood hypothesis depends on how you define cataclysmic flood hypothesis. Right. If we're talking about all the details of what was involved in cataclysmic flooding, we were just beginning to recognize the complexity of that in the 1960s. So there was no resolution. The resolution was people accepting that there was cataclysmic flooding <laughs> at all, <laughs> right. which was right. not the case yeah. prior to the 1960s. Right. Uh, it, it, it began to change with uh, the Bretts et al. 56 uh, and the marshalling of evidence, but even that wasn't getting through. I remember the Thornbury uh, geomorphology book that I had in one of my geomorphology courses. It was a revelation to me that I had three introductory geomorphology courses at different schools, and they were all totally different. Uh, that showed <laughs> me that was a field I needed to get involved in. Uh, but anyway, the, the Thornberry actually gave credence to Flint's hypothesis and the various other ideas, which were completely bogus. Uh, and and it wasn't till really the, the like the letter in, in the, the 65 went to Brett's. It was an indication that the, that hypothesis, the original Brett's, there was a cataclysmic flood. That's what I was talking about. Yeah. Not that we understood. <laughs> we are far. And in yeah. fact, I'm a fallibilist, and it would take a while to talk about that. Science is essentially fallible. It doesn't mean that science shouldn't be trusted. It means that we can never be absolutely certain about anything. Uh, as a principle, if we absolutely knew things, there would be no science to do. So the definition of science, which is the intense activity of people dedicated, a whole community, to discovering the truth of things, if, there, if we knew truth, there's no science. So mm. it's incompatible to have absolute truth with science. So we, we, there are always things to discover. And we discover because of the anomalies that we encounter when nature presents them to us. If we think we know, we need to go out in the field, look, 
And nature will tell us if we really know or not. And nature always tells us we don't know enough. Yeah. There's more well, to find out. And, and those personalities have disappeared in a lot of ways, too. I mean, you don't have, like, football coach geologists anymore, right, running around telling people, no, my God, this is the way it is, and you're going to do it my way. And they're kicking the leg out from under your tripod and, you know, running their field course like a boot camp. That just doesn't seem to be today's world. It yeah. used to be. It, well, it's also called humility before nature. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, how about, I just got, yeah, go, Nick, what go. do you want to do? Well, I think, I think uh, let me reframe what I think I'm hearing, and then we'll see if your remaining slides can kind of fit into that, Sky. Uh, how many more do you have, by the way? Uh, about uh, four, for, and they're just for Mission Valley, Party, and Alden, just kind of okay. right here, what I'm dealing with. Well, I want to go to those, but let me let's just let me toss this out. I had, this is kind of a new thought for me right now, based on what you guys have been talking about. Isn't it like there's two major stories separated by the decade of the 1960s? I'm starting to see that pre-60s, this is obvious, pre-1960s, the major narrative is, did these catastrophic floods happen or not? And of course, that's the story that's been told many, many times. But then we send the telegram, and then Vic, you can confirm this, that in, we're in the late 60s and into the 1970s, that major controversy is on the back burner or totally out, and everybody's saying, yes, we do have major catastrophic Missoula floods in the Pacific Northwest, but since the 60s, now we have these different opinions on how many floods, sources of water, and so on. And so it, I think it can get confusing if you're writing something about in the 60s, are you in the older argument, the pre-60s argument, or in the post-1960s argument? Vic, do you remember people adamantly arguing against catastrophic floods in the 1970s? Or was it just a turn of a, uh, was it as, as flipped switch as it seems from the okay. 60s on? I don't think it was a flip switch. I think uh, the the big debates uh, kind of uh, developed through the 30s and then into the 40s. I think Pardee's uh, paper on the unusual currents was important, although the key point, which I don't think has been described uh, very much, was a meeting of the AAAS in Seattle in 1940. Yep. In that, me that was the meeting where Pardee's paper was given orally, and, and Flint had a, led a field trip afterwards, and on that field trip, participants, uh, particularly Aaron Waters and Ira Allison, Allison they yeah. totally destroyed Flint's yeah. arguments in the field. Bretz wasn't there. Bre Bretz was... He, he abandoned the Scabland stuff. In the 1940s, he was into caves, uh, uh, and uh, Brett's, uh, that was a new controversy because the origin of limestone caves was actually a big controversy, and Brett's naturally was attracted to the problem. But, but he, he, was, he didn't get back into the Scablands until the 50s when he went out with uh, Smith and Neff showed him all of the all of the new data from the Bureau of Reclamation. Uh, that 56 paper described uh, what Brett's termed uh, giant current ripples, partly inspired by uh, Pardee, partly from uh, 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 Neff finding the giant current ripples in the Bureau of Reclamation data. Uh, so all of that was building up uh, Flint uh, uh, basically sort of abandoned the whole business yeah. and wanted to forget about it. Uh, Brett's, uh, uh, you know, impishly <laughs> reminded him, but uh, Flint wouldn't wouldn't respond. Uh, he actually only had a sentence of it in his uh, last edition of his uh, Quaternary Geology of the U.S. Probably the most spectacular thing to have happened in the. Uh, Turner in the Pleistocene, Flint mentions in one sentence in his textbook, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which is telling us something. Yeah. Uh, uh, there's a lot of, about Flint, but, but we won't go there at, 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 at this point. Uh, 
but uh, my my role. It, it, so I got involved serendipitously. Uh, the quantification in terms of the basic physics of how the flooding worked was uh, minimal. Uh, Brett's uh, he wasn't into mathematics. Uh, he had a, uh, a uh, engineer in his department or at the university do a calculation for him. He just avoided that. There were things in the textbook that water couldn't flow as fast as, uh, as was required for the scab lands. All of that was wrong physically. So I proposed doing that. I got a little a bit of money. Uh, it was an NSF grant. Uh, it was a, a little over four thousand dollars. My NSF grant. I, I like to point out that the mystery of the mega flood Nova production was two million dollars, and it, it came off of you know partly my four thousand dollar NSF grant. Wow. <laughs> uh, but and I wasn't. Uh, my advisor had to you know turn in my stuff for the grant because I I was just a grad student. Um, but, but, but right, uh, but right, right there in the 1970s, uh, yeah. were were there vocal critics of the concept of a, of a catastrophic flood anywhere Not in vocal. geology? No, there were no, there were no vocal critics. There, there were people that were moderately skeptical, uh, but it was beginning, it, it was coming into uh, literature, and. There were also, and this was an important part of how geology works, uh, another of Brett's mistakes was that he argued, understandably, that this was a unique phenomenon, that this had not happened anywhere else in the world that he was aware of. It turned out that was totally wrong. Uh, Hal Maldi was pointing out in the 1960s that you had the Bonneville flood, and Hal, Hal tried to get me to work on the Bonneville flood. In fact, uh, when I went uh, when I, w I went to see him, of course, because he had come out with his Bonneville uh, paper, and uh, uh, I, I talked about all the quantification. He wanted me to do that for the Bonneville flood. It would have mm -hmm. been an easier problem, and Jim O'Connor. Ultimately, did it uh, with the help with uh, bon when Maldi, fortunately, was still alive when Jim did that. But uh, and Jim was my student, of course. Uh, but I did the Missoula flood, and uh, not long after my paper was published in '73, actually in the same year, the Mariner Nine pictures from Mars showed cataclysmic flood channels <laughs> on the on the planet Mars. Just so cataclysmic, <laughs> yes, that, that's my book from 1982. Yeah, I was just uh, thinking about it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so cataclysmic flooding is a planetary scale phenomenon. And we now know of uh, uh, an, an incredible number of post-Pleistocene cataclysmic flooding phenomenon all over the world. The English Channel was created by cataclysmic flooding. So all of that was coming together in that we're not talking about some unique thing. Mm -hmm. We're talking about a global phenomenon that was previously unrecognized mm -hmm. because people weren't thinking that way. Uh, so it, it's, uh, uh, it, it's an exemplar of a whole uh, important way of how geology comes together to understand things much bigger than the Channel Scabland himself, it, and uh, Brett's fortunately was alive when the space pictures came available, and it, it, money began to flow for studying cataclysmic floods. My four thousand dollars was <laughs> quickly eclipsed by uh, significant NASA money uh, to uh, study the phenomena. Um, so can I yeah. just jump in there, uh, Nick? Yeah, you're by by seventy three when you publish your GSA special paper. I mean, you pretty much put the it's 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 uh, accepted. I mean that that kind of puts a stamp on on Brett's work. That's the way I see it. And then the other thing is um, uh, Headward Retreat. So. Pardee recognizing early in the 20s that the scablands probably developed by, by head cutting, that wasn't a flood 
specific process. That could happen in other ways, right? Just regular fluvial action. But but the, but the leap that, that Bretz was making, and the, the leap I guess Pardee may have made early too, was that it was flood-caused headward cutting. But head, head cutting itself didn't seem to be um, controversial. It was more descriptive. But I, I guess I just bring that up because I see it in those early notes where headward cutting wasn't necessarily a flood phenomenon. Is that it, am I right? It, 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 headward cutting by a major river such as yeah. the Niagara River and or the Zambezi Falls or Igatsu Falls uh, on the uh, Parana, uh, that kind of headward cutting, nick point in a river, is not controversial. Right. What is in the Scablands, the head cuts, the cataract retreat, absolutely not that. It, yeah. cannot, the ripples. it cannot be that. Yeah. The reason is, and this was pointed out by Bretz, this has been not understood even in some modern papers that will go unnamed, uh, that the only way you can cut HU cataract or even the uh, Palouse Snake Divide, even the Grand Coulee, you have to have a drainage divide you have to impound water upstream of that drainage divide, and a valley has to become completely filled with water, like Washtak Nakuli. It spills over the divide, and on the steep part, you develop a cataract that recedes back. And it may only recede back partway, or it may, like in the case of the Grand Coulee, cut all the way back to the Columbia River. Cataract, retreat, through pre-drainage divides. That is the process that requires catastrophic flooding. That was described by Bretz, and that's still something that people don't adequately understand. Mm -hmm. They have even referred to the features like dry falls as waterfalls, as receding waterfalls. No, they are subfluvial cataracts because the water flowing over the top of them was essentially as deep as the height of the falls or larger. That's not a trickle of water over a waterfall. He's Brett, getting hot. Brett's pointed that out. Yes. Uh, yep. <laughs> That's great. Well, can I just read, I, you know, it's, it's hilarious you bring that up. The first words of your book are, can I just read the first sentence here? Oh, it he says, goes to the glasses. Nice. He, sa he says, had this book been written only 15 years earlier, its title would likely have relegated it to the realm of speculative philosophy, perhaps even to fictional accounts. And then you go on to talk about um, the acquisition of the, the Viking images. And, and it's really, it's, I think that's where we are now. I think we're at this sort of cusp of, uh, we're transitioning away from certain parts of geology into maybe more um, AI, may, maybe more technology-driven. We certainly see it in the aid, the emphasis on age dating. I mean, just the overemphasis on, well, all these ages say this, so there can't be anything else. And, you know, even in your Mars thing, you were at the cusp of a new technology there, right? This This book was able to be written because of satellite imaging had come across a threshold and was working in the way it should. I guess I see where, I don't, I'm not sure where we're going with flood research, but in geomorphology in general, but we see we're kind of at a different transition now too, aren't we? Do you, do you see that? I mean, at the University of Arizona, Arizona you guys are cutting edge as anybody. I, th I think the, uh, the technology like AI is uh, is making certain kinds of reasoning that is part of science uh, more powerful than uh, even human beings are able to do. But there is another kind of reasoning that I think AI will never do. Mm. And this, this is a, a, a big interesting question. Uh, so I don't Maybe one way to explain this is I don't think if AI was dealing with the problem that 
J. Harlan Bretz came to a completely different way of looking at a landscape in the Channel Scab land that AI would have discovered. And this is a key thing. Does AI really discover things mm -hmm. or does it assemble information in what's called an inductive way where it then poses uh, a description of patterns that takes from pre-existing, like large learning models like chat GPT, pre-existing ideas and applies them to those patterns and then tries to relate them. Can it do something totally different mm -hmm. that is not in anything pre-existing mm -hmm. and come up with a completely different idea that is presented by nature itself? Can AI read into nature the way a human being can? Some sound skeptical. <laughs> I've re actually written about this uh, yeah, because I yeah. think there is uh, there is something to that that uh, uh, that that uh, AI is never going to be uh, something that totally replaces us. It can do many things better than the human investigator could do, but there's some parts of the investigation. Some people might call it the intuition the sense of the problem uh, that it will never be able to do because it's not connected to the world. It's an artificial construct. It's always separate. And by always being separate and that lack of connectivity, it will never, uh, never replace certain kinds of human activity. Yeah. Yeah. Fascinating. Uh, Sky, let's bring this one home. Let's go through a few final slides, kind of go back to some field yeah. questions, uh, whether AI is going to play a role in some of this work down the road. Who knows? But as Vic oh, is yeah. saying, there's no substitute for some, some old-fashioned work as well, and you're about as old-fashioned as they come, Sky. So yeah, let's I let's let, let's uh, well, let's look at old-fashioned then. Um, there we go. So right, so right outside my door is one of the sort of unexplored landscapes. Well, let's see. The Mission Valley has had a lot of work done, but it hasn't had a lot of synthesis work done. It's mm -hmm. had a lot of reconnaissance work done. And here's two guys, uh, Alden and Pardee back in the 20s with their hot rod uh, model T's, I guess. Great photo. Uh, they were here, you know, doing some of their best work. Um, the deposits here don't seem to fit uh, simple facies models for, for till or for glacial lake deposits, lake bed deposits. They're, they're sort of this hybrid. So if you get stratified till that was dropped through the water column onto the bottom of the floor of Glacial Lake Missoula. So the, the deposits are weird. But in certain places, it's fairly obvious. This is lake beds over till. There's a big boulder and there's wow. a geologist. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, this is right outside. And this is outside my door, right? This takes five minutes to go over here. Look at this. Huh. Um, so but I'm, that's all Wisconsin, isn't it? Um, I, I think so. Yeah, I think so. Where this is, is 30 kilometers south of Polson. So this till is certainly south of what many called the terminal moraine, the Polson moraine. So this is Mission Valley. Here's Flathead Lake. Here's the Mission Range to the, to the east. Most people call the terminus of the Flathead Lobe of the Cordier and Ice Sheet the Polson moraine. But Mission Valley has at least two or three other tills that are older and moraines to the south. And people have been recognizing that for more than a hundred years, but there's still a controversy. So like a lot of places in the Scablands, here's a perfect example, a tidy little valley with a fundamental question. Was this the terminal moraine for the Cordier and Ice Sheet? Or was this? And 30 kilometers separate those. So, so I'm working on this right now and just quickly running through some basics, sort of framework stuff. Here we are in the Mission Valley, way all the way up here at the farthest eastward end of what's kind of known about the Scabland system in terms of its lakes and ice dams and, and channel profiles. So here we are, this really interesting part of the world near the nine mile section of Chambers and Curry and others, but 
different. You know, we're an hour plus away from the nine mile section. So here's a, a map by, let's see if I can zoom in a little. I'm not sure I can. Uh, I'm not gonna. Here's the Flathead Lake, south end of the Flathead Lake. Uh, Flathead Lake's a huge lake. It's like 10 miles wide and 30 miles long. So this is a big bay. And the Polson Moraine, or the terminal moraine for the uh, Cordillera and Ice Sheet of Flathead Lobe is, is usually placed here. But this map from Ostina and others clearly shows several recessional moraines that extend, you know, tens of kilometers to the south. So I'm remapping this with LIDAR data and refining what these guys did and, and really trying to put a clearer stamp on this idea of um, where the terminus of the ice sheet was in northwestern Montana, or at least here. It's easier here in, in uh, the Mission Valley because it's just easier to get around and there, there aren't a lot of trees. It's almost all farmland. But as we move to the west, towards Libby and into the Idaho mountains, it gets a lot more difficult. So it's kind of a test case for the new technology LIDAR uh, hillshades and LIDAR resolution imaging that um, can maybe develop a, a concept here and then move into the more ambiguous parts of the landscape. So that's what I'm working on. So the idea is a classic uh, problem that we still are, are looking at. Is this the terminus or is this the terminus? And how old are those two moraines? Are we looking at Pinedale and Bull Lake or are we looking at um, subdivisions of that uh, late Wisconsin ice? That's all, I'm, that's all I'm doing. So what are the ages of those uh, so southern um, um, morainal forms. Well, they're not well dated. Uh, yes, I mean, Rich, Richmond describes sites where lake sediments that he interprets as Pinedale, Overlie, Bull Lake, Till. Uh, well, and, you know, he, he, he interprets it as Bull Lake because it looks to him more weathered than Pinedale Till. Uh, but that's basically his criterion. Uh, yeah. And, uh, you know, could they be interpreted as older hills? Uh, they don't necessarily have the soils on them they it, you know were those in place underneath uh, a lake could you have had floating ice shelf over mm -hmm. a lake mm -hmm. uh, and floating ice shelves wherever you've got glaciers coming off a ice sheet entering into a lacustrine body and we could talk about this for glacial lake columbia too uh, you could get floating ice shelves um, and uh, that would make very different kinds of, uh, of stratigraphy because uh, you could you could have uh, a, a lot of bottom density flows that are related to the subglacial uh, water uh, sediment rich water that's coming into an, underneath that floating ice shelf. This is something to think about for the Spokane area. Back to uh, right, right, yeah, to uh, uh, Nick's question about w what could one look for in the Spokane area? Well, could we have had floating ice shelves in earlier times that wouldn't have left their evidence there because we had an earlier impounded glacial Lake Columbia? Uh, and that, you know, if, if your Okanagan lobe can advance in earlier times and block to create an earlier glacial Lake Columbia, then you, and I'm being very hypothetical here, right. might you have had more extended ice that was as ice shelves, perhaps impinging slightly on the plateau where you might have had some ice shove, but not really typical glaciation mm. coming across the upper end of the what's now the Cheney Palouse track. Uh, both Pardee and Bretts were impressed by the fact that you didn't have Luss Islands and other evidence there. They thought that was one evidence of why you didn't ha why a glacial lobe extended there, but you don't have a lot of good evidence of till. You've got a lot of uh, water washed stuff. Well, here's a you know I just throw this idea out. You got an ice shelf, mm. and the ice shelf 
partly impinged over the plateau, uh, and maybe what you really only ever had there was stagnant ice, but that doesn't mean that you'd never had ice there. Interesting. Um, yeah. Uh, so, so what Nick was covering all all series was these fundamental questions and these re revelations and new letters about the Spokane area, about Bretts and Party and Flint discoveries, right? New discoveries. What you just said, Nick, uh, ice shelves. People haven't br really discussed ice shelves at all. There's probably a potential for new discoveries, um, and then. I just happen to move here from Alaska and look out my backyard and go, well, what's going on there? And there's probably a potential here to refine some of the uh, previous geology. So, I mean, it's like everywhere you, sw you can't swing a dead cat without finding new places to discover things in the scab lands. It it's certainly not been solved, and there's 10 good projects just waiting out there for a, for a graduate student or two. Final words from you, Vic, and I think we'll hang up today. Anything you want to wrap up with, or you feel like we've we've done enough for today? Well, I, you know, I I'm looking to the new generation of geologists. Uh, I think Sky's beginning to do that too. <laughs> uh, he can speak for himself, but uh, there's plenty to do. There's plenty of new questions. Uh, uh, I just threw out one idea, probably right. potentially crazy. Uh, uh, and uh, I have lots of other ideas that are even more wild than, than those. Uh, I, I'm hopeful to do a little bit of writing about that sort of thing because uh, that's the way science advances, and we need a lot of new eyes and new thinking. Uh, so I hope there's plenty of people listening to this and uh, listening especially to you, Nick, because I think you're inspiring uh, a lot of uh, young people to think about these problems. There's plenty to do. These things aren't solved. Uh, you know, as uh, Einstein w once said uh, uh, about being an expert, he said, uh, all my life I've questioned authority, and uh, in uh, punishment for this, in my old age, I have been made an authority. <laughs> <laughs> That's a perfect way to end. Um, <laughs> you guys hang on the line. I'm going to stop the record button, and then we'll just chat a little bit off, off camera. But uh, Sky Cooley, thank you for your time today. Thanks, Vic Steve. Baker, thank you for your time today. That worked out beautifully. Uh, I hope we can do this again sometime real soon. Okay, Thanks, you guys. Thanks, Thank Nick. you.